Uh, what Sylvain didn't tell you is that while I live in Dublin, Ireland, I'm actually Romanian, which means I get to do a lot of jokes about being a vampire. And there may or may not be an actual video of me dressed as a vampire doing a zip line across Dublin for the Dublin Bram Stoker Festival. So may or may not, in which I really did wish that I don't die because I was very afraid of heights at the time. So hi, everyone, and welcome to this magic course in which we're going to talk about something very serious in a very unserious way. And I'm going to start with a bit of a story to give you more context into the examples that we're going to use today. So I work for uh, Intercom, and our main front-end application is a four-years-old Ember app with a Rails backend. If we're looking at our stats, over the past month, we've had about 55 authors that committed more than 650 times to master, which resulted in almost 2,000 file changes and 30,000 additions and almost 22,000 uh, deletions. And on top of that, shipping is at the heartbeat of Intercom, uh, which means we ship to production more than 100 times a day. So that kind of gives you like a little bit of perspective into uh, like uh, the fact that we're going to face a lot of challenges and we have some crazy examples. One of our uh, very important components is a real-time editor that enables our customers to create messages for their customers. And we also allow those messages to be personalized using uh, HTML input. So something that's very important when dealing with HTML is data sanitization. Uh, so uh, let's say if you want to you know, uh, work with uh, URIs or data sources, something that you want to do is actually uh, encode that URI before you're returning it. So in this case, like the code looks really simple. You have an element, you're checking if it contains a source or a H reference. Uh, so doing like that source with that H reference. And then if it does, you're encoding, you're encoding it and returning it and it's supposed to work, right? Well, actually it turns out that browsers are wonderful, but they're also really, really, really weird. And one of the weirdnesses is that doing that href can sometimes be undefined even if it's present in the code. And if right now you're kind of like, wait, what the? <laughs> that was exactly our reaction when we had to deal with this in November. And um, let's look at an example. So say you have a link that is inside a math tag, an actual malformed math tag. And you have a link that is outside of, uh, just like on its own outside of a math tag. Turns out that if you go to a console and do, hey, give me the href value for the first link, the browser is going to go, it's undefined. And if you're going to do the same for the second link, the browser is going to be like, oh, yeah, here you go. So that's kind of weird, right? Um, and it also allows for the link that's inside the uh, math tag to actually uh, skip our encoding and uh, just be returned on, on its own, which can generate uh, like a stored uh, vulnerability. And turns out that the safe way to do it, according to browsers, is to actually use get attribute uh, to get the href value and uh, be able to like encode it and return it correctly. Even more than that, like some of the browsers, like Safari, actually refuses to display the, the first link altogether. It just displays nothing. And then for Chrome, the first link is not even a link. It's like I don't know what to do with it. It's just a blob of text. So that's kind of weird, and it goes to my point that when it, it comes to like user input and in general security for front-end applications, it's very important to know your enemy. And contrary to popular belief, it's not always user input. It's also br uh, like browsers play an important role as well, and you should really understand uh, more about what they're doing and how they're doing things. Um, so how do we go about dealing with all that weirdness? How do you, like, what is it that we can do? Well, something that's very important that can help is actually writing code that deals with weirdness a little bit better. So you're never going to be able to, like, uh, say that, hey, I'm it's a question of like when you're going to actually, like, introduce a, an XSS vulnerability. It's a matter of time. You're never going to be able to, like, fully, like, eradicate it. But you can write code that behaves a little bit better. And you can also write tools that detect an alert when such weirdness happens so that you have a little more uh, context on how you can improve. And that's what, uh, like the mission of what we're going to try to do here today. So when you're looking at your front-end application, you can split it into two parts. There's the HTML part that displays everything and it's user-facing. And there's the JavaScript side of it, which is your controllers and your components and everything that has the logic of the application. Something that's very important, especially when you're talking about HTML, is understanding how your framework actually deals with HTML. Um, so more, uh, almost all the modern web frameworks, uh, the rendering engine escapes the HTML by default. And it's their way of actually protecting you against XSS vulnerabilities. Um, so if we look at an example, say I want to write a very silly helper that just returns an image of a cat. So um, I write my helper, and I just return an image tag with a source of a cat. 
your web framework, in this case is Ember, it's going to say, well, I don't think you want to do what you think you want to do. So I'm going to go and escape that for you. So instead of an image of a cat, you actually get just a blob of text. And if you do want uh, to uh, be able to see the cat, you have to tell Ember, hey, actually, this HTML that I just told you to return, it's safe. I'm going to vouch for it. I want to see the cat. And then Ember is going to be like, oh, OK. And it's going to show you uh, an image of a cat reading military strategy, which is pretty much what we're doing right now. <laughs> and also, there's a gist for that. So if you, like, you want to go and try it on your own, it's on my GitHub account. But it kind of goes to the point that you should avoid having to decide if HTML is safe, because it introduces assumptions, and the reality is that you never know. And when I say HTML is safe, that it's HTML safe in Ember. And then React has its own ver version, which is like dangerously set in our HTML, and they, were, they use the word dangerously just to like attract your attention that you shouldn't be doing this. And it's trust as HTML and Angular, and I'm pretty sure that Vue and other frameworks have their own version as well. So how do you do that? Um, well, a very good thing to do is uh, look at your components and try to make your components better to avoid having to say that things um, should be returned as they are because they're safe. Um, and you should avoid having um, your components use like a def uh, have their arguments be like a de facto public API that everyone else that implements that component needs to use because that's how you like you introduce like it have the use the engineer having to take like these escape routes like html safe and you should also build your components with like usability and sm smaller simpler to use in mind so if we're looking at an example, see I have this very silly, very simple card component that just displays a title, which in this case is Gryffindor, and then it displays a, a message. And say that in about two months, I want to reuse that component because, hey, code reusability, right? But instead of just displaying a simple word or message, I want to be able to style it, and I want to say, hey, name, and then that name be in, uh, to be in bold. Well. Because my component, my initial component was so difficult to uh, reuse and its API was very strict, a very simple way for me to do that would be to say, well, I'm just going to use that title to be a HTML, uh, like uh, just a HTML thing high and then whatever style I want to apply. And because it's mine, I'm going to say, well, this is safe to display. What could go wrong? Well, actually, what if name is um, like a script? What, what do you do then? So like, the reality is that you don't know. And a better approach would be to actually split this component into two smaller components, so a title component and a body component, that are wrapped into the super card component, and leave the title and the body to actually deal with different cases about how they're going to um, implement different situations. So the idea is kind of inspired from object-oriented languages, right? That composition instead of inheritance is better when it comes to components. So rather than like trying to figure out like all the scenarios, uh, use um, design a component with the idea that it gets to decide on its implementation and it's doing one thing and it's doing it really, really well. And then better encapsulate, which also points to better encapsulation and clarity. While your implementation of like the title or the body can change over time, the big card component, um, like the, the interface to those smaller components doesn't change. So uh, the big card component doesn't need to change and can be reused in different situations, um, which makes everyone happy. So there's actually a really good tutorial about this. So if you're using Ember, they're calling this uh, what I just explained, contextual components. And there's a really good tutorial on Ember map for that. And if you're using React, React wrote a really good blog post about why you should use composition instead of inheritance when writing your components, and how to basically build your components with the idea that, hey, in two months, you, they might have to fit uh, different requirements or have a different style. Um, also, helpers are very, very important. So helpers are um, the, the things that don't necessarily fit into the component, but the component uses them. And you should always prefer updating the, and working with the DOM directly over returning HTML from a component. So say you write a helper that just returns an email address. Um, a better way to um, do this would be to use the DOM to create an element, set the attributes, create the text node, and then append uh, say, in this case, it's a link, append uh, that anchor as a child element. Um, so by creating it as a text node, instead of just returning like a HTML email, you leave the browser to like take care of that escaping. And you take that level of complexity from your code. And it always ensures that uh, like you don't have to make any assumptions about what that email is going to look like or what should you do to be able to escape it.
And React is actually one of the frameworks that strongly recommends you go and interact with the DOM. I think Ember is kind of getting there, but this is a really, really good pattern to like follow, especially if you have a lot of helpers in your code. If you're using a framework, a web framework that uh, actually uses templates, and by templates I mean handlebars or mustaches, they've introduced something called triple curlies. So what triple curlies is basically the equivalent of escaping HTML that you would use in your components or in your helpers. Um, so it's like HTML safer templates pretty much. And using them on direct user input can introduce vulnerabilities. And while you can do that, it's a very, very bad idea because again, it involves assumptions. So the idea would be to not deal with that complexity at the template level and extract it to the helper and to the component. So good helpers and good components should actually avoid you ever being in a situation where you have to deal with escaping HTML on, on any sort of template. And also, talking about like weird vulnerabilities that happen on the HTML level, probably using target blank is one of the most underestimated security vulnerabilities of, of, the, old, of the time. And you should always use target blank with no opener and no refer. And the reason for that is because when you're doing target blank, it actually gives the linking page, it gives partial access to the linking page uh, via the window that object. And while some of those permissions are blocked by uh, same origin policies, uh, window that opener that location is fair game, which means um, a malicious website can actually change the window opener location to whatever phishing uh, location that they want and introduce phishing vulnerabilities in the code. What's even weird about it is that Firefox decided that they just do not want to implement no refer until version 52, which I think was released at the end of March. Uh, but we all kind of know that you can't really, you know, assume that users will upgrade in a timely fashion. But they had this vulnerability open for about two years. And I think Instagram finally fixed this sometime last year when a blog post aggressively targeted them in Facebook for not, um, not wanting to fix this vulnerability. So now that you know a little more about how to make your code better, how do you go about detecting and alerting these things to like, actually make sure you're moving forward? And whenever like, a new engineer comes on board, um, they don't introduce a new one. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about static analyzers and how we use them in Intercom, uh, especially ESLint and template linters, and why regular expressions are evil, and why lines in the sand or watermarks are love, and they should be used. Um, so. When we're looking at the template, if you want to write your own, the idea, or like any sort of linter, the idea is very simple. You can use something like an abstract syntax, syntax t tree, which is a uh, short uh, AST, where every node in your tree means something. So in the case of triple curlies, uh, or like the mustache syntax, um, node sees that as a mustache statement. So you can pretty much say, hey, if when you're parsing uh, the tree, if this is a, a mustache statement, do something to it, like throw an error and tell me that um, you're not supposed to use something like that. And in the case of an element or target blank, which is an attribute, you can use something that's called the element node and then check the node attributes um, to make sure that if um, the attribute target is present, that it also has rel no opener and no referrer. And I'm going to show you an example really, really soon, and this is going to make more, a little bit more sense. Um, and you can also plug this in with your CLI, which means when you're, uh, like as an engineer, whenever you're writing your code in dev in your template where JavaScript file compiles, uh, you get to see an error if you're doing something wrong, so you don't have to wait for like tests or CI to be able to run to go and fix your code. Um, big frameworks like Ember that use templates and rely on templates heavily have figured out a really good way to do this. So there's a really good plugin, it's called Ember Template Lint that um, I've contributed to a couple of times. Um, and they uh, give you a bunch of rules like uh, detection for triple curlies and detection for uh, no opener and no refer and like if you have comments and a bunch of other wonderful stuff. But if you're, if you're using a different framework but you use templates and you want to write your own, I highly recommend you go and have a look at the Ember template lint. They're doing a really good job at keeping the rules up to date and um, it's, um, it's an Ember adapted node plugin so it can be used as inspiration for anything. So a little bit of a story time, because what do you do about JavaScript? We just talked about template, templates, but what do you do about JavaScript? Um, so we've had this idea that before we tried ESLint, when we were using JSN, to use grep to actually detect 
um, weirdnesses in our code, like using HTML, say, for example. And the idea was pretty much to write a post build hook to integrate with the CLI so that whenever um, your app runs locally, um, you get to have feedback on what's going on when the file compiles. Um, and then use find plus grep plus a regular ex expression plus account to be able to get the count of whatever it is that you're looking for. Say it's HTML safe. And then um, compare the count against the static limit and fail the build if the numbers don't match. And that worked, but well, the regular expressions are a little bit like black magic and they're powerful, but they're like very, very dangerous to maintain. Um, so we looked at ESLint and actually uh, writing a, like a custom rule that checks for blacklisted methods. So the idea would be to um, create a custom rule using ESLint that would receive as a parameter a list of methods that we want to look for in our code. And then check if they exist, and if they do, just return a, uh, like show an error so that engineers can say, oh, I'm actually doing something wrong and I should probably go and uh, refactor my code a little bit more. So the way we've built this is using something called uh, an ESLint CLI, and that's not, uh, that's, uh, so ESLint is something that you can use with any framework. It's not like framework specific, but different frameworks um, have like their own plugins to make working with ESLint a little bit better, which kind of makes sense. Um, so using ESLint CLI plus the custom rule, that's just a separate node plugin. Um, in our case, it will integrate with the Ember CLI because that's how you're going to get pretty things displayed on the screen. Um, and then enable ESLint caching uh, for performance reasons. And if you are using ESLint, this is going to probably change your lives if you're not using it already. So we pretty much went from a build time, because like you've seen how many files we have, so we went from um, having to wait um, like for about 30 seconds uh, for feedback on the entire files uh, to show up to actually 1.5 uh, seconds, which is like a significant improvement. And that's all due to caching. And we apply caching on both test and dev environments and such. Um, and then, uh, so, uh, run the, so run the new rule, get the, get, get the count, and then fail the build, actually fail the build in dev or test or whatever, if the error count that you're getting is higher than a predefined max allowed. Um, so. In case of the Ember CLI, it looks pretty much something like this. So it's a breakdown of different steps that Ember uh, runs before they, uh, they start your app. And then a big fat error saying that, hey, you've actually, um, you, there's supposed to be zero HTML safe, but you've just added one more. So um, are you sure you can't do something better about that? So then the engineer goes, OK, fair enough. And they refactor their, their code, and the world is safe again. Um, so the good news is that we're working on actually making this, uh, so actually making this available to you all. Um, for those of you that use Ember, it's going to be uh, like an um, an Ember add-on, and for those of you that use any other framework, we're going to create a Node plugin so that uh, you can use uh, this outside of like Ember applications as well, and it's going to be available really soon. Something that is not necessarily front-end related, which was exactly the which was the focus of this talk today, is the content security policy. And for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's a, a way to whitelist or um, mark scripts as being safe, like scripts that you do want to run as being safe, and stop the ones that you don't uh, th like, stop malicious or inline scripts from executing outside of. Uh, so outside of the ones that you already have included in your app. Um, and uh, Thule didn't read, because this is kind of like a talk on its own, is that you should use like version 2 or version 3 of the content security policy, where you should try really, really hard to, to upgrade. And the reason for that is because of the hash source and non-source, which allows you to have a little more control about the scripts that are executing and, um, and inline scripts. And again, it's a kind of a talk on its own, but it's a ton of resources on the web. So I strongly encourage you to like go read on that. So a little bit of a summary um, on how to you know, keep sane when dealing with front-end security vulnerabilities and as an engineer when you have to work on a security-related uh, task. Uh, you should know a little bit about the content security policy, and it's a very efficient way to um, like block vulnerabilities. Uh, you should care a lot about clean code, and you should care about how you deal with uh, different weird situations. And you should care a lot about tools, and you should be able uh, to make sure that you are alert on weirdnesses and that your engineers have the right inform have the information available really, really soon, uh, really, really early in the development stages. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah.